Okay, so thank you, thank you very much. Uh, th thanks to the organizers for the invitation and putting together this this conference. Um, it's nice to see old faces and, and mostly new ones uh, for me. Um, so uh, for, first, let me just say a few things. So so unfortunately, mirrors and moduli uh, will not really play much a role of a role in my talk, and, and neither will M theory. Um, although my defense, I think most of the theories that I am going to talk about can be constructed in M theory, and probably there's something profitably to be understood by doing that. Um, also for Galois actions, um, I understand a lot of the audience is mathematicians, and uh, for, for mathematicians, of course, Galois theory is a very standard thing that's been developed over many years, and it's sort of second nature. Um, in physics, it's much less common, so, so the, the Galois theory that I'll describe here will probably be very sort of lowbrow for a mathematician. Um, but this is based on work uh, with uh, with my really excellent uh, PhD student, Rajat Radhakrishnan, um, who will be a postdoc uh, this fall at ICTP in Trieste. And this is primarily based on a paper that we wrote in September. Um, and I'll refer to a past paper that also says some interesting things. Um, and then also some thoughts and work uh, that's, that's in progress. Um, so actually, before I mention what the broad goal is, uh, I think in light of Tudor's really excellent talk yesterday, I should clarify what I mean by TQFT. Um, so for the purposes of this talk, um, TQFT will be a two plus one dimensional non-spin semi-simple TQFT. So Tudor yesterday was talking primarily about non-semi-simple uh, TQFTs um, and sort of uh, in his very nice way brushed aside uh, the semi-simple ones. Um, on the other hand, uh, semi-simple TQFTs, as we'll see, are a very sort of wild and rich uh, environment to study field theory in two plus one dimensions. So in general, all the classification theorems um, for TQFT in higher dimensions fail uh, when you try to consider semi-simple TQFT. So in physics language, the question might be phrased as, are all three-dimensional um, semi-simple TQFTs Chern Simons theories or not? And nobody knows the answer to that question. Maybe more mathematically, you could wonder about these semi-simplifications of these quantum group categories at roots of unity that, that Tudor talked about yesterday and ask if those exhaust the set of modular tensor categories. And I think the, the consensus probably is among category theorists that the answer is no. Um, there are all sorts of more exotic things that you can also consider. Um, so I'm gonna use TQFT in this sense, in the sense of basically modular tensor categories uh, or just sort of semi-simple non-spin two plus one D TQFT. Um, and uh, the, the broad goal um, of this talk and, and of this line of research, at least for me, is to try to use these kinds of field theories, which are wild, um, but under more control as toy models um, and stepping stones to understand things about the global structure of the space of quantum field theories. So here I've drawn a cartoonish um, diagram for what this space might look like. So it's some space T that surely has some very interesting and deep mathematical structure. And at different points, I've drawn sort of physically interesting theories. So you have things like the standard model, something beyond the standard model, the Ising model, Trent Simons, um, N equals force of Briang Mills and quantum gravity in ADS space. So this is a very rich manifold where points correspond to different quantum field theories. Um, and its structure is obviously poorly understood since quantum field theories in general are poorly understood. But just thinking in this way um, leads to several natural questions that have interesting analogs and partly solvable analogs uh, in the context of TQFT as defined in this way. Um, so natural questions that arise are what kind of symmetry structures, groups or categories, if you're fancier, uh, act naturally on this space? Um, and what are the kind of relations that you can define uh, on this geometry? So things to think about are things like renormalization, group flow, all sorts of thing that phys things that physicists think about and want to understand. Um, and other questions are things like what kind of are there closed subspaces of, on, this, on this space of theories? And if so, in what sense are they closed? So defining closure with respect to something like the renormalization group flow is a hard problem. I don't think anyone has ever managed to do it. So you can think of all these kinds of sort of fundamental questions um, that come just from thinking about this space. Um, other questions are things like what minimal um, and universal set of observables characterize a, a, a given quantum field theory. So in the old times, people used to think about um, symmetries and relevant operators and symmetries that act on local operators is possibly classifying quantum field theories. Um, we kind of know that now that, that story has to be much more complicated. So certainly it has to involve probably non-local operators um, and maybe categories and all sorts of other things. Um, and uh, a fourth question um, that, that, that is interesting is to think about what kind of number fields in the number theoretical sense are observables valued in. So in general, this is a hard question to define 
precisely because, of course, there are ambiguities and observables. You can rescale operators uh, in various ways. And so defining what I mean by this question in the general quantum field theory is actually very hard. We'll see what it means in the context of these TQFTs. But if you're, since, since many of the people here think about um, supersymmetric and superconformal field theories, um, one nice set of observables you might think about this question um, in regards to are things like scaling dimensions. So for example, in a superconformal field theory, if you have enough supersymmetry, um, you have a large uh, R symmetry. And so protected operators tend to have scaling dimensions in the field of rational numbers, simply because there are unitarity bounds that relate scaling dimensions to representations of the R symmetry group. Um, and so this sort of gives you, this forces you to have to discuss rational uh, ra rational scaling dimensions. Um, in theories with less, slightly less supersymmetry, like 40n equals two, where you have abelian R symmetry factors, the question is still interesting, and it's related to the questions about whether a cyborg witten curve always exists, or maybe some other geometry from which you can read off scaling dimensions of, of, of protected operators through, through, through complex structure deformations. In, in the context of theories with even less supersymmetry, like 40n equals one, um, it's an interesting question to think about what number field scaling dimensions take values in, because um, th very generally, they seem to be algebraic numbers, and they seem to be related to Tooft anomaly matching. Um, between Lagrangians um, and, and superconformal field theories in the IR. So all the, the point of this talk is mainly that all these questions can be asked and to, to a certain extent partially answered. Um, obviously, we, we don't have the full set of answers, but th they can be partially answered. Maybe there's a roadmap to try to, to answer them um, in, in, in the arena of TQFT as I've defined it. Um, so, so in particular, um, the relations that we'll consider will be some discrete transformations related to a Galois group that will take you between points that correspond to different topological field theories in this space. And um, we'll see that this, um, that this Galois, this Gal these Galois groups and these Galois transformations are nice because they'll give us all sorts of non-trivial results about theories that are sort of related to each other along orbits of these, uh, of these Galois groups and that are closed under um, Galois action. Um, and we'll also see that Galois action gives some insight into what kind of observables one might want to write down to sort of minimally characterize um, TQFT. We don't have an exact answer for that, but we have some ideas about where to look, thanks to Galois theory. Um, and uh, um, it'll also have some interesting things to say about what number fields observables are valued. In. Basically, up to some, 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 some conjectures, a natural thing will be that in the context of these TQFTs, um, the number fields will be some, uh, basically some degree two um, extensions over the rational numbers, some, some, some things called CM fields. Okay, so, um, so, so that's the motivation. Um, oh, actually, it continues. So, so for the physics people, um, a, a related but harder problem in the same spirit is to, uh, is to do basically the conformal bootstrap, where you take um, a bunch of four-point functions, you impose associativity of the OPE, and you try to solve a, a, an infinite set of equations or maybe a finite subset. And so these diagrams have some complicated structure and solutions in conformal field theory that usually require a computer to study. Um, but as we'll see, these kinds of diagrams reappear in TQFT um, as solutions to a finite system of polynomial equations, um, which leads to a simpler problem um, with, with, with a natural um, Galois group action. So, um, um, so, so yeah, so, so, so this, this picture we'll see leads to a partitioning of the space of TQFTs into orbits of the Galois group. Um, and since these orbits will be discrete, um, there's no immediately natural sense of a small deformation. So for example, um, what can happen is unitary theories, which physicists like to study, can often be related just by Galois transformation to something non-unitary. So this seems from the point of view of physics, something quite exotic. Um, at the same time, um, we'll see that this Galois group action has nice physical properties. So for example, it'll preserve things like one form symmetries um, and it'll preserve certain average link invariants and measures of topological entanglement entropy. I won't really discuss this, but this is uh, an old paper we wrote in 2019. Um, and it'll also be useful. It's useful in the classification of TQFTs and also the study of, of gap boundaries. So um, before kind of moving on with the talk, I'm gonna give um, a partial summary of some of our claims. Um, so the, 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 there are a lot, of, a lot of results, I think, in, in this paper. So I'm, I'm gonna only list a few of them and ones with asterisks next to them, I'll say a little bit more about. Um, so uh, one natural question um, when you have a Galois group action is to understand um, how it acts on the symmetries of the theory. So, so a theory, these kinds of TQFTs that I'm discussing will have zero form symmetries and one form symmetries. Um, for mathematicians, um, 
uh, these, these zero form symmetries are basically symmetries that are generated by, well, some charges that live on um, co-dimension co one um, surfaces in space time and act sort of on, on points, naturally on operators that live at points. They can be coupled to background um, one form gauge fields. Um, and one form symmetries are um, things that naturally live on co-dimension two surfaces and that can be naturally coupled to, to two form gauge fields. And two groups are sort of some cohomological construction that mixes zero form and one form symmetries in, in some interesting way. And uh, one of our results, which I'll briefly, very briefly touch on later in the talk, if I have the time, is that zero form symmetries and two groups are preserved under Galois action, at least if they're unitary. Um, in the context of anti-unitary zero form symmetries and two, group, two groups, the same is true up to a natural ansatz that one has to make on the defining uh, number field um, of, of the theory. Um, but um, sort of post facto, this ansatz is reasonable because it's consistent with the fact that if unitary symmetries are preserved under the Galois action or are isomorphic under the Galois action, um, you don't expect non-unitary ones to, to not be because non-unitary symmetries quite generally square um, to, to, sorry, anti-unitary symmetries quite generally square to unitary ones. So, so if you wanna have something in mind to think of as a physicist uh, when thinking about this, you can think of something like SU5 uh, at level one trend Simons theory which has an order four time reversal that squares the charge conjugation. So it'd be pretty strange if under some kind of geometric, some kind of group action, um, the, 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 the unitary symmetry like charge conjugation um, is preserved or, and, and the anti-unitary one is not. So, so sort of post facto, this suggests that, that, that one might even take seriously the fact that um, the ansatz that we make um, for the underlying number field in the case of anti-unitary um, zero form symmetries um, is, is something that, that really works in general. Um, and so I'll, I'll discuss that, I'll discuss that uh, in, later in the talk. Um, another thing you can do um, as a physicist um, is when you have symmetries, you can gauge them provided that anomalies vanish. Um, and uh, one can ask how the Galois group action acts uh, when you do that. So um, for, uh, for, for, um, for physicists, this C sub G, you should think of as some TQFT um, with some background zero form gauge fields turn on that you're then going to sum over. Um, and Q is some Galois action. And you can imagine first doing the Galois action on this theory, then gauging, that's what this G superscript means, or alternatively taking the gauge theory, which is the C superscript G and acting on it with, with a Galois transformation. So there's some kind of uh, sort of commutativity between gauging um, and Galois transformations. Um, for mathematicians, the CG um, for, for those of you who are, who are experts in, in, in modular, in, in category theory, these are what are called G cross braided uh, categories. Uh, then there's a closely related operation called taking the Drenfeld center, which is closely related to gauging. Um, and this too acts in a nice way, uh, sort of compatible and almost commutative um, with, with the Galois action given by elements Q and Q prime. So um, there are a lot of other things to say. So things like the global structure of topological quantum field theories will be preserved under the Galois action. Um, I won't really describe this um, for the experts. This is basically just an application of Galois theory um, to Muger's theorem on um, modular tensor categories. Um, uh, other things to say. Um, so, so one question, uh, one of the motivating questions of this talk is to understand what one can say about subspaces of, of, of field theories. And what we'll see is that Galois action naturally leads to an understanding that they're closed, um, uh, uh, that, that discrete gauge theories are closed under the Galois action um, and gives us many related statements. And things like dualities, um, which exist often in quantum field theories, including topological quantum field theories, webs of dualities and duality relations are also going to be preserved uh, by the Galois action. Um, and finally, uh, things like one form symmetry um, and their gauging um, you, you can consider one form symmetry gauging. Um, uh, and uh, um, basically the story is that uh, uh, the Galois action, um, um, again, sort of commutes with, with um, uh, one form symmetry gauging and in, in particular Galois invariance is preserved um, under, under one form symmetry gauging. And studying theories that have more and more complicated Galois orbits will lead to some interesting sort of organization, I think, on this space of topolo topological field theories. And in particular, if we consider theories that are sort of fixed points of this Galois action, which I'll describe soon, then we can, up to a, up to a conjecture in the literature, classify them entirely. Okay, so, so these are some of the claims. The claims with asterisks are things that I will hopefully touch on, um, depending on how much time uh, I have. I may have to jump, uh, jump ahead and, and skip some of these things. 
Um, so, uh, so, so for me, um, as I said, two plus one d TQFTs will basically be the same thing um, as as modular tensor categories. So they'll be essentially semi-simple things. Um, so these are quantum field theories that are defined on some manifold that, up to some subtleties, don't depend on the metric. Um, and also, um, as I said, I'm going to discuss non-spin theories. So these are also ones that don't depend on any spin structure. Um, and in this talk, it's going to be useful to have a more algebraic um, approach to TQFT. And one reason is just that um, the, these more algebraic approaches to TQFT tend to have a bit less redundancy. And so it's nice sometimes for proving um, general facts. But um, as physicists, it's also good to sort of keep in mind um, things like Trent Simon's theory, uh, which, which Tudor talked about yesterday. So thinking along the lines of Trent Simon's theory, the basic observables are again these exponentials of, of these uh, connections, these, these gauge fields A. Um, and the correlators of these objects compute various topological invariants of the manifold. So this kind of um, program, research program, at least in the world of high energy physics, was sort of started with, uh, with, 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 with the work of Witten and the Jones polynomial. Um, and Witten li uh, Wilson lines are topological. Um, so in other words, you have some operator product expansion for them, um, which you know, doesn't depend on, on distances uh, and, and doesn't depend on geometric uh, quantities. So, so these Wilson lines, I should say, at least in terms of theory, are labeled by some representation R of some gauge group G. But in general, there are going to be more abstract um, TPFTs one can consider, which may not have an interpretation in terms of a Trent Simons theory. So um, one interesting fact about the, the line operators um, in the theories that we're considering is that they're sort of anionic. So they have they, they experience some kind of aronov bohm phases. So you can imagine writing operators, draw, drawing lines um, to, to, to Wilson lines, say that sort of um, that link each other. Um, and uh, since these are topological, you can imagine taking Li and sort of shrinking it to a point. And everywhere in, a, in, in all correlation functions, um, th th such an equation will hold, where basically you can replace, you can act on, you can use Li to act on Lj and just replace that um, by, by some, some number, lambda ij, um, which is written in terms of some, some modular S matrix, but it's some number, which includes some phases, some, some in general interesting um, anionic phases. And this um, basic structure is encapsulated in an algebraic object that's called the modular tensor category, which I won't really bother defining, but it has some grading and it has some non-degenerate grading in particular. Uh, so, um, so, so the idea is basically, again, sort of more abstractly, just start from a bunch of simple objects, consider their fusions, um, and uh, you get some OPE of this type, some operator product expansion of this type where their fusion essentially results in a sum over a, a, a finite number. Um, of simple, simple objects. Um, so you have these fusion coefficients, nijk, which are positive uh, semi-definite numbers. Um, and they're sort of dimensions of some Hilbert spaces associated with three punctured spheres where, where these objects all come, come in together and fuse. So um, for, uh, for, for uh, if, in the case, if these fusions, so, so if these fusion rules um, are rules for a group, which doesn't happen in general, but if all, of your objects, all of your simple objects, they have fusion rules that are the fusion rules of a group, uh, then um, the theory is called abelian um, and the fusion rules are those of, an, of a finite abelian group. Um, and if not, um, the theory, so, so if you have at least one fusion where you have multiple outcomes, um, the theory is called non-abelian. And the abelian part is going to give something called the one form symmetry. Any questions so far? Um, I, I should say one, one, one more thing. Um, when, 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 you, when this LJ line is, is trivial, you, you get just a circle, which you should think of the expectation value of a loop on S3. And this measures something called the quantum dimension, which sort of tells you how many degrees of freedom, um, the, how, how many degrees of freedom this, this line has. So fusions also have to be associative. So this bootstrap diagram that we had in CFT reappears essentially as um, some, some um, condition where you, uh, essentially um, uh, transform um, a, a diagram involving three incoming lines going to an outcoming line uh, in this way through some change of basis matrix, uh, which is called sometimes the F move or the F transformation. Um, it's a kind of three co-cycle, at least in the case where these things are group-like objects. Um, and uh, more generally, it's, it's, it's a three co-cycle in some kind of more exotic um, cohomology. And the conditions, uh, that this um, that this uh, that this f symbol 
um, the consistency conditions for this F symbol are a set of equations called the Pentagon equation. So one starts from four incoming lines going to an outcoming line and produces a set of moves, which give us a, a, another diagram over here. And there are sort of two paths that one can take. So one can go either on the top path or the bottom path and sort of demanding that these two paths give us equivalent configurations at the end gives us a set of polynomial equations um, involving these F symbols. And these polynomial equations are gonna be where Galois theory comes in. So, so, so the things, so, so, so the polynomials will be polynomials in these F symbols and the Galois groups will be things that act on these F symbols. And in these modular categories, we also have a notion of grading. And so there's, a, there's a, something called the hexagon equation that sort of demands compatibility basically that, that enforces compatibility of these F transformations with, with braiding. So, so these R transformations are, 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 are essentially braiding transformations where you sort of, where you braid one line around another. And so, so these equations, these hexagon and pentagon equations together, give a set of consistency conditions that one uses um, and define and it'll allow you then to consider. Um, so solving these equations give you some R symbols and some F symbols, which define the theory and live in some number field. And the question is, um, what, what is that number field or, or can you, arrange for there to be a nice number field um, in, in, in given theories. So yeah, so here, here's in a little more detail what R is. R is basically twisting um, two, two, two lines around each other. Um, and these can also, I should say, be used to define um, the topological spins, the theta Li of these different lines. So, so, um, so, so this is, for, for people who are thinking in terms of CFT language, this is basically the T matrix um, of, of, of the corresponding R CFT that might live on some gapless boundary. Um, for which this describes the three-dimensional ball. So together, these things characterize the modular tensor category. Um, but of course, as anywhere in quantum field theory where you have things meeting at a point, there are ambiguities. Um, and these ambiguities in, in, in this world, in the world of modular tensor categories are essentially a, an ambiguity of choosing a basis um, associated with each of these intersection points. So, 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 so each of these points where things fuse together, um, there's a vector space associated with it. Um, and uh, Choosing a basis on this space, of course, is it's, it's a matter of taste which which basis one to choose. Um, but one can always use so, so so in general these F symbols and these R symbols are basis dependent objects, and of course the number field that they take values in um, will be will be ambiguous in that sense. It'll depend on um, the basis that you choose. Um, but things like link invariance, um, things like you know the stuff that Witten computed in his Jones polynomial paper. These are things that are uh, independent of basis and, and give you nice physical quantities that you would like to use to try to characterize um, a TQFT in a more gauge invariant, in a more sort of invariant basis invariant kind of way. Um, but I should say that after quotienting out by this ambiguity, um, the solutions become discrete. And so these modular tensor categories and the corresponding TQFTs are rigid in the sense. In this sense, they have no moduli. You know, you have Trin Simons theory, which has a group and it has a, a level, but there's no sort of continuous deformation that you can make that affects the physics of the theory. So this is to be contrasted with the kinds of TQFTs that Tudor was talking about yesterday, these non-semi-simple TQFTs where you have a bunch of such deformations. Um, so, 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 right. So these theories that I'm going to consider are essentially discrete and rigid um, objects. Um, and there's going to be a natural uh, Galois group that arises. So are, are there any questions about this? So um, this is an embarrassing slide for an audience with mathematicians, but um, let me first just describe um, what I have in mind uh, for, for the Galois groups um, that will play a role. Um, but um, so, so, so the idea is that um, the, 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 the Galois groups um, that, that I'll describe um, arise in the context of certain special field extensions, E over N. Um, so in our context, we're going to be mostly interested in them as arising from roots of polynomials with coefficients in N. Um, and uh, the Galois group, um, which I'm going to write as Galois E over N, uh, arises basically as the automorphisms of E over N that fix N pointwise. And so if you think of E um, as a, a vector space over N, then the dimension of that vector space is the degree of the extension. Um, and as we'll see, um, one doesn't have to go to very high degree um, to, to, to capture the number theory. Of these of these theories. So um, so just as a very simple elementary school example, um, we can take n to be the set of rational numbers, uh, the field of rational numbers, um, and then we have the equation x squared plus one equals zero. Uh, and of course, um, although the coefficients are in the rational numbers, the solutions are not. 
Um, and so appending this solution, the solution uh, plus I say to the rationals gives us this field extension E, which can be written as Q of I. Um, and the Galois group in this case um, is just Z2. It's the thing that sends I complex conjugation that just sends I to minus I. So it's the thing that sort of permutes um, solutions uh, to this equation. So, so more generally, what we want to do um, is not consider a single, a simple uh, quadratic equation, um, but instead consider a system, basically, of uh, polynomial equations, um, you know, essentially cubic equations in F, um, and also equations in F in the braiding. And we want to solve those equations. Um, and again, there will be a Galois theory, a Galois group associated um, with, with those solutions. Um, and the point is that the Galois group will naturally take you between different solutions, just as the Galois group in the case of x squared plus one equals zero took you between the solutions plus or minus i, this Galois group will take you between essentially different solutions um, of these hexagon and pentagon equations. So cohomologically different solutions. So um, one thing that, uh, that's been proven in the literature um, is that if you want to look at the Galois group for the defining data, this, these, these so-called F and R transformations, these, these F matrices and the braidings, um, what, what you can always work in a, in a gauge based in a, in a set of, in, in, a, in a basis choice for these fusion spaces where uh, uh, the corresponding Galois group um, is, is, is an algebraic, the, the corresponding field extension um, is Q, F, comma, R. So in other words, the field extension you get by adding F and R uh, to the rationals um, is algebraic. So in other words, the, the, um, the, the dimension of the vector space E over F is finite. Um, and uh, so, 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 so you'll have some nice Galois group um, and, and things, of course, that are constructed algebraically and nicely from F and R will transform nicely uh, under the Galois action. And one natural question is, among all choices, what is the minimum degree of the allowed field, for example? So, so this is a, a non-trivial question. Um, uh, in general, the, the conjecture in the literature seems to be that the answer of, for, for that should be two. Um, and that probably uh, all theories um, can be described in a way where um, the, the, the defining number field is just a cyclotomic field. So basically just a field where you take the rational numbers and you append some, 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 some root of unity um, to, 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 to the rationals. Um, uh, and so then the corresponding group will be some abelian group. It'll be some uh, group basically of um, things with multiplicative inverse mod n, let's say, if you're adding an nth root of unity. Um, uh, but well, as we'll see, the story is potentially more complicated um, and might involve slightly more exotic degree two fields called uh, CM fields, of which um, um, uh, cyclotomic fields are sort of a, a particular, particular case. So, so I, I should point out that, again, this is something non-trivial. So for example, if you, if you consider sort of non-modular, like exotic non-modular categories, so it's, it's uh, in fashion these days to think of um, these kinds of fusion categories um, that, that Hogg group found. So, so there's this famous um, spherical fusion category that's related to this Hogg group subfactor, or the even part of the Hogg group subfactor. Um, and there you can try to play the same kind of, you know, you have F symbols and you can try to play the same kind of game and ask if you can get something um, cyclotonic, um, and it's been proven by mathematicians, Morrison and friends, that essentially in that case, you can't do it. So, so it's a non-trivial question about whether you can actually ever get down to something like a, a cyclotomic field or some, something simple, like a degree two extension. Um, but in the case where you have modularity, non-degenerate grading, um, um, the, the, the answer, the answer is, is, is probably yes, you can always work with some kind of simple degree two extension. Um, so um, let me make a couple of comments. So um, first of all, um, this kind of transformation, although I haven't written the equations explicitly, I hope you can see you're, to, go, to go around this diagram, you're essentially performing F transformations in different places. So here to go from this diagram to this diagram, you're performing an F transformation here, right? To go from here to here. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, you're, you're actually performing uh, an F transformation here. Sorry, you're taking three and you're sort of putting it here. So, so, so you're, 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 you're performing this kind of F transformation here. So, so of course, moving um, from the left to the right will give you a polynomial equation. Um, and then you can, um, you, you can, you can apply uh, Galois theory to these solutions. But one thing I should say is that these um, pentagon and hexagon equations, they take as input essentially a set of fusion rules, right? That's how we write down these diagrams. So this A of course has to be uh, in the fusion space of one and two, B has to be in the fusion space of A and three, et cetera. 
Um, so, so, so it takes as input a set of fusion rules. So that already means that if you're interested in things like one form symmetry, which correspond to <coughs> objects that have uh, <coughs> fusion rules of, a, <coughs> of an abelian group, um, those kinds of things will be preserved on the Galois action because the Galois action will just take you between different solutions of these polynomial equations, essentially. So things like one form symmetry, things that correspond to abelian subgroups of the fusion rules, those, those things will be preserved. So, so you'll go from the one form symmetry before and after a Galois transformation will be isomorphic. The, the, the one form symmetry groups will be. So this is kind of a trivial consequence. I mean, this is a well-known consequence. This is nothing deep or interesting, but it's a well-known consequence basically of this construction. Okay. So any, any questions on this? Yeah, so, 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 so these, right, so, yeah, so, so, sorry, so, right, so, so these Fs, essentially, you should think of them as matrices, which take external lines as a label, so basically, they have four labels, M, N, P, R are essentially naming this matrix, if you like, uh, and, and then D and C are essentially, they're, they're essentially changes the basis, so, so, so this D is essentially acting, summing against this line, this, this, in, this interior line, uh, so these, these are basically six J symbols or generalizations of six J symbols. Other questions? <laughs> okay, so maybe, um, so, so, so now we've established roughly what uh, a, a Galois group is, what, what, what it does in terms of these um, pentagon and hexagon equations. Um, so, so now, at least for physicists, it's useful to look at examples, um, maybe less so for mathematicians. But uh, so, so, so one example is what the condensed matter people call the semion theory or what high energy people call SU2 at level one trend Simons theory. So this is a theory with essentially two types of line operators. One is the trivial line and the other is um, the line corresponding to the fundamental representation of SU2. Um, so, so that line, which is non-trivial, I've called S. And if you take this fusion of S and S, um, it gives you the trivial line. So, so, so this, this, um, this set of line operators realizes um, the, the it's, it's fusion algebra is basically um, the center of SU2 and Z2. Um, and actually it's a theorem um, for abelian transimons theories or abelian or, or modular tensor categories with abelian fusion rules that all the data of the theory is determined by the topological spins, which is nice. I mean, these are actually gauge independent. These don't depend on the normalizations that you choose for your fusion spaces. Uh, and so um, the, the, the line operators in this theory, their topological spins are, well, the, for, the, for the trivial line, it's just, it has a trivial spin, it's a boson, of course. Um, and this, this line corresponding to the fundamental representation has spin I, um, so it's some kind of anion. So um, the Galois action actually, so, so even though there are F and R symbols that you can write down in some gauge that take this nice form, you can just alternatively for abelian theories, ignore those and just study, um, just, just look at the twists. Um, and you see here, of course, the twists, uh, it's very obvious that, 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 that this is, um, that, 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 that the field is just um, the field that you get by extending the rational numbers by adding I. Um, and so the Galois group in this case, again, is just Z2. It's just complex conjugation or, or more physically for physicists, it's some kind of time reversal. Um, and what it does is it takes the, 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 the topological spin of this non-trivial line and takes it to minus itself, I to minus I, which at the level of a bulk, three-dimensional TQFT is the same thing as either thinking about SU2 at level minus one, turn Simon's theory, or equivalently, at least for bulk 3D TQFT E7 at level one, okay? So that's what Galois action does in this case. It's basically a time reversal, but it can be much more exotic. So here, I'm just making a bunch of other points. N none of them are terribly important. Um, just one, one thing to say is that these quantum dimensions, which will come back later, um, this, this quantum dimension um, for, for, for both of these lines in this case is equal to one. So quantum dimension, remember, is sort of the um, S3 expectation value of, of, of a loop of, of the line. Um, and since these are um, group-like objects, um, that their quantum dimensions are all one, basically um, the, they, 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 they have to satisfy these fusion equations. You can just get that by drawing closed loops and fusing them together and seeing that they should satisfy the fusion rules. Um, so, 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 right, so this is one example. Uh, one slightly less uh, 
trivial example, but nonetheless not particularly complicated, is what's called the double semion in the condensed matter literature. And in the high energy literature, it's sometimes called the twisted Z2 discrete gauge theory. So it's the discrete gauge theory with some non-trivial dicraft witten twist, um, or sometimes referred to as SC2 at level one times E7 at level one, or SC2 at level one times SC2 at level minus one, uh, Chern Simons theory. Um, and uh, the fusion rules in this case are slightly more elaborate, but not too much so. They just give you Z2 times Z2. So, so in particular, these are the non-trivial rules, where S, of course, is the non-trivial line of SC2 at level one, and S bar is the non-trivial line of, of E7. So, so these rules are not, not particularly hard to see. Of course, E7 at level one will have the same fusion rules. S bar times S bar will be one. And then S times S bar, of course, will give you uh, so, so, some, some new object. Yes. Sorry. It is what? Sorry. The Galois action. Yeah, I'm. I'm going. I'll, I'll describe it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, indeed, it's going to. It's going to essentially switch the two factors. It's going to be a symmetry of this theory. Yeah. And and we'll try to generalize this to, to much more exotic. This, this kind of thing to much more exotic theories. So so here. Um, so, so, so so indeed. So so this is the spectrum. So again, since it's abelian, um, we can just look at the spectrum of of topological spins. Um, and as Cyril is is rightly pointing out. The Galois action, the complex is, is again complex conjugation, of course, um, and and it basically interchanges um, these two factors: the non-trivial lines of SU2 at level one and E7 at level one. Okay. So this is a symmetry of the theory because basically it can be undone in this case by a time reversal. So 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 this is a theory that's 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 invariant under the Galois group, and it's sort of a prototypical example of of a theory that's invariant under the Galois group, and we'll want to sort of generalize this. Kind of idea abstractly. So one thing that's going to be important later on, um, so it, it, is that these these theories have what's called a Lagrangian subcategory. So if you think of these as a as a as a as a Z two discrete gauge theory, essentially um, this line and this line are um, the, the first and the last lines are, are are what you would call Wilson lines in the sense that they carry um, electric charge. They carry some representation of the gauge group. And trivial uh, magnetic charge. So, 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 so theta one comma one and theta s comma s bar are, are are Wilson lines. They're bosonic, and essentially they correspond in the Z two discrete gauge theory to, to things that just carry some representation of the gauge group, but nothing else. And these um, turn out to form uh, what's called um, a Lagrangian subcategory. So, so that's basically um, a, a subset of bosons. So here you see th these lines are both bosonic. Um, and uh, they satisfy another condition, which is that basically um, the square of the sum of the squares of the quantum dimensions of these S3 expectation values of each object um, is equal to um, the, the sum of the squares of the quantum dimensions of the whole category. So, 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 so here, that is to say that um, the, since, since all these objects have quantum dimension one, um, if you take one plus one and square it, that's the same thing as one squared summed four times. So, so that's the same thing as saying two squared equals four. Um, so, so these kinds of things, so, so, so these kinds of categories um, appear um, in the line, appear in, um, in, in always appear, are basically the definition of a discrete gauge theory. Um, and uh, the idea um, for, 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 well, for, 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 from the category, categorical point of view is that, um, uh, these kinds of categories, these Lagrangian categories um, or Lagrangian subcategories, um, uh, um, they braid non if, if, if you take any object that lies outside of this category, it sort of braids non trivially with at least one of the objects inside the category. So, in other words, um, for, for category theorists, the Muger center of um, the Lagrangian subcategory is the subcategory itself. So, for physicists, um, this is roughly due to, to, to modularity. Um, and, and, and the Arano of Bohm um, phenomenon. So, so um, uh, if you think about an Arano of Bohm experiment um, and you think of the magnetic flux, uh, you think of some heavy sort of electrically charged particle um, orbiting, uh, orbiting a magnetic flux, um, the, the, the origin of the, of the Arano of Bohm phase is this sort of interplay right between electric and magnetic quantum numbers. Um, and uh, so, so, so in particular, uh, uh, if, if all magnetic fluxes, let's say, are, are invisible to, 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 to all, all, all the electric fluxes, 
um, then um, so something in the theory has to break down. In particular, mo modularity, um, uh, the, the, the theory has to be non-modular. So, 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 so these kinds of Lagrangian subcategories uh, made of Wilson lines are sort of the, the, the definition, the underlying definition of what one means uh, by, by a discrete gauge theory. So um, the, the, the general abelian picture um, is that uh, we have a space of theories uh, corresponding to abelian finite groups. So uh, organized by rank, by basically the number of simple objects and partitioned into different Galois orbits. In the case of the first uh, group, in the, in the case of the first example, the orbit was something of length two. In the case of the second example, it was something of length one. Um, I, I didn't really describe the non-abelian case, but I'll, I'll, I'll get to some theorems on the non-abelian case soon. Um, for the non-abelian picture, again, you have some fusion categories that can be completed to modular tensor categories. They're organized by rank um, and partitioned again into um, Galois orbits, um, but it's unclear how many of them are described by um, the kinds of uh, descriptions that physicists like, like Chern Simons theory. So all these examples that I mentioned so far are just essentially Chern Simons theories. But in the non-abelian case, you get more complicated things. And you can also get things like um, transitions between, as I said, unitary and non-unitary theories. So things like G2 at level one Chern Simons theory. Uh, can be transformed into something corresponding to Liang theory. Um, so you can use, you can lose unitarity in general um, when you when you consider sort of more complicated theories um, than the abelian ones that, that, that I've discussed. Um, so any any questions about this? Um, like Sure. Yeah. I mean, so the, the, so 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 you have in, in general these thetas are you know some complex. Yeah. So um, so um, since um, since, since uh, um, uh, Galois actions um, uh, preserve the, the, the fusion rules, um, um, uh, obviously abelian theories are mapped to abelian theories. This is nothing deep or profound. Um, but what we saw in the example is exactly what Cyril noticed, um, which is that this Z two um, discrete gauge theory is mapped to itself under the Galois action. Um, and so um, this suggests many questions. One question is whether uh, discrete gauge theories are always mapped to other discrete gauge theories under the Galois group. So if they form in the space of TQFT, something that's closed um, under this action. So this is some attempt to answer the question of closure of, of subspaces of theories. Um, and um, it also suggests trying to organize maybe more broadly the space of theories into um, theories that are invariant under Galois action than theories that are maybe in orbits of order two, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so the first target would be to try to classify the space of Galois invariant TQFTs. And as we'll see up to some, um, using some conjecture in the literature, we'll, we'll be able to, 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 to do this kind of classification. Um, and more indirectly, um, it suggests the third question, which is if we start with a Galois invariant theory um, and gauge a bosonic one form symmetry, do we end up with something that's Galois invariant? Um, again, this is suggested by this Z2 um, discrete gauge theory. Uh, because, um, well, if you take, so, so, so this, this, this Wilson line here generates some non-anomalous Z2 one-form symmetry that you can gauge. Um, and if you gauge that symmetry, essentially what you do is you project out these other lines because they braid non-trivially with it, with, 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 with this Wilson line. And all you're left with after doing that is basically the theory of some classical zero-form symmetry that's dual to the one-form symmetry that you gauge. So, so when you do this, you essentially, at the level of partition functions, you do some Fourier transform by summing over the 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 the, the one form connection um, and uh, sorry the two form connection for the Z two one form symmetry and, this, and you just get something that depends on some dual um, zero form symmetry variable. So this gives in the condensed matter language something called an SPT a Z two SPT or just in the, a theory basically of zero form of zero form group defects. And since it's valued in Z two, um, it turns out to be something which is Galois invariant. So this fact may also also suggest this question. Like if you start with something that's Galois invariant and gauge a bosonic one form symmetry, um, do you end up with something that's Galois invariant? And the answer will be, the, the answer turns out to be yes. Um, but, okay, so, so I'll, I'll take these, these questions one by one um, and probably skip over some things because I think I only have 15 minutes left. Um, and I'll try to comment um, on some, 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 some thoughts and work in progress on, on classification of, of, of theories. Um, Along the way, so uh, so, um, so 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 let's first try to understand if discrete gauge theories um, are closed in any way under the Galois group. So so this seemed to be the case. Just studying the example of this twisted Z two discrete gauge theory, 
Um, so to, 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 to do that, um, uh, we have to sort of define what we mean um, by, 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 by a discrete gauge theory. Um, and uh, um, well, the, the, the important fact is that um, some subset of these um, of the line operators of a discrete gauge theory are just electrically charged. So they're just carrying representations of, of the gauge group. So these are the things that I call Wilson lines. Um, so these are labeled by some representation Ri of the discrete gauge group G. So G is some discrete gauge group. Um, and their quantum dimension, uh, this, this, this expectation value of a loop of such, of, of such a Wilson loop um, is just the, the size of, of the representation, uh, the size of the charge, basically. Um, and uh, in, in all discrete gauge theories, as, as, I, as I explained, um, the Wilson lines um, form, um, form a Lagrangian subcategory. Again, this sort of follows from um, our own of Bohm phase and modularity. Um, and uh, um, such subcategories are essentially characterized by this equation, equation 18, which tells you that um, the dim of this, so, so these Wilson lines, by the way, I should say form a subcategory of, called rep G, um, whose fusion rules are basically um, the, the, the semi-ring um, of def defined by, by, by rep G. Um, and uh, the, the, the subcategory, um, it's, it's Lagrangian, so, so, so the, it's dim squared. So in other words, the square of the sum of the squares of the quantum dimension give you the dimension of the full, uh, of the full category, of the full theory. Um, and the important thing is that um, in equation 18, basically all the things that enter into defining this Lagrangian subcategory um, are integers. So obviously they're gonna behave nicely under uh, any kind of Galois action. So, um, so the, the fact that there exists a set of Wilson lines that form a Lagrangian subcategory turns out to be basically the formal definition of a discrete gauge theory, roughly for the reason that I mentioned which is that every other line in the theory has to braid non-trivially with at least one Wilson line. So when you gauge um, this, this rep G subcategory, um, you project out essentially anything that carries magnetic charge. Um, the Wilson lines all get associated with the vacuum because you organize things in, in orbits of, 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 of the Wilson lines. Um, and so you end up with, again, just a, a, a theory of some classical um, connection, zero form connection. Um, zero form symmetry connection. You, you end up basically with some GSPT. Um, and so th this is sort of the, the inverse of the procedure that you use to construct a discrete gauge theory. You start with some, um, some, some, some um, SPT or maybe in more mathematical language, some, some G graded vector space and you gauge or you take the Drinfeld center of that um, and, and you produce uh, uh, a, a discrete gauge theory. So, so anytime you have such a, rep, such a subcategory, such a Lagrangian subcategory, essentially of, of bosons, like the Wilson lines um, and um, uh, satisfying um, this, this condition on their dimensions, um, that, that, that can be interpreted as, as, as rep G category for some G. Um, and this corresponds to the G of the, of the group, uh, of, of the gauge group, the discrete gauge theory. So it's easy then to show that this space of theories is closed under the Galois action. So the point is again, these quantum dimensions, they're integers. Um, and the dimension of the category is integer. So this equation 18, of course, doesn't change under a Galois transformation. Um, also the condition on trivial braiding is again, just involving integers, namely the integer one. So um, Lagrangian subcategories are preserved. So in other words, um, uh, something that was a discrete gauge theory has to be a discrete gauge theory after you, after you perform a Galois transformation. And moreover, um, using tanaka Krein reconstruction, um, you can also prove um, that um, not only does it have to be a discrete gauge theory, um, but in fact, uh, it has to be a discrete gauge theory with the same group G um, and uh, possibly a different twist, a different digraph width twist. Okay. So any, any questions about this? So, so the upshot is just that there's a simple definition which of, of what a discrete gauge theory is. It interacts nicely with Galois transformations so, so, so basically this space of theories is, is nice and closed. Another thing I should say is that um, nothing stops a uh, discrete gauge theory from having multiple Lagrangian subcategories uh, for different groups uh, GI. Um, and so in principle, um, you can think of a, a different, of a given discrete gauge theory as a discrete gauge theory with respect to different groups, different GI. So this is a common thing that happens in physics. This is basically a duality. So oftentimes, 
um, you'll have the same description of a theory involving two different gauge groups and two different um, twists. So for example, if you think of S3 discrete gauge theory, if you've ever looked at that, um, there are two Lagrangian subcategories, um, both corresponding to rep S3. So in this case, it's kind of a self-duality, um, but you can take either the Wilson line corresponding, so, so you can, so, so S3 has um, uh, essentially, uh, well, it has three representations, the trivial, the sign, and then the two-dimensional representation, the three irreducible representations. So you have three simple Wilson lines corresponding to each of those representations. They form a Lagrangian subcategory, but then there are also, there's also a flux line. There's also a flux line labeled by, um, by, the, um, by, by, by the, 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 the conjugacy class of, um, of uh, the, the two cycle conjugacy class, um, which also has quantum dimension two and also gives you a Lagrangian subcategory. So the S3 discrete gauge theory, it turns out can also be thought of in this way as sort of a, uh, this sort of electric magnetic self-duality in that theory, sorry. Yeah, so, 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 so this S3 discrete gauge theory, it has essentially, so, 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 yeah. Yeah, so, 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 so you have, you have this line. So, so these are the Wilson lines. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, and then you have, um, th th then you have the conjugacy class. So, so, so you have conjugacy, you, you have, you have magnetic fluxes that are labeled by conjugacy classes as well. Um, so, 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 so this is the magnetic flux line that I have in mind. So, so, so it's labeled by this one to a conjugacy class. Um, and, and so th th you, you, there's an electric magnetic duality because you can either build a Lagrangian subcategory. You know, there's an electric, if you like Lagrangian subcategory or alternatively there's, there's sort of a magnetic Lagrangian subcategory. Um, but the point is that since, sub since Lagrangian subcategories transform nicely under the Galois action, these kinds of dualities and more intricate duality webs are also preserved, which is also a nice fact. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I mean, here it's boring for S3 because S3 is invariant under the Galois group. Actually, you can prove that any discrete gauge theory with a trivial twist is invariant under the Galois action. Here, here also there's no H3, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So, 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 so you, you, you could, I guess. Um, yeah, I mean, but then I guess you'll, you'll have some dependence on a, on a spin structure. So you'll need to, at the very least, I guess you would have to consider sort of spin QFPs. Um, and then actually, yeah. So, so, so everything I've said here actually depends, uh, or many of the things depend on the fact that it's non-spin. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting open question. That's, that's one direction that we're, we're thinking about. Is thinking about sort of spin QFTs. Um, which might be a precursor to thinking about things like supersymmetry. So, um, so okay, he, here I'm going to sort of be very schematic because this is kind of work in progress. But um, it, this this is th this discussion um, is also closely connected with the question of finding physical observables that classify a theory. So, so one conjecture that floated around for a long time in the literature was that basically if you take the modular data, so the S matrix, the T matrix, and the topological central charge, so, so the central charge mod eight, um, maybe of the corresponding uh, rational conformal field theory that, that lies at the boundary um, of one of these theories. Um, if you take these three objects, the conjecture was that this would be sufficient to sort of classify, um, to, to classify um, these theories. So you don't have to worry about solving you know, all these horrible pentagon and hexagon equations. If you just want to sort of distinguish theories, you could just look at this nice sort of gauge invariant data. S and T, S is basically a hop link, so it doesn't involve any fusion spaces. So, so, so there, are no, there are no sort of um, uh, ambiguities about normalization of fusion, of, of, of fusion spaces. Um, T is just this, this, this topological twist, uh, sorry, this, this, this topological spin, uh, and C is just a number. Um, but uh, the Galois action actually played, played an important role um, in showing that this conjecture is, is not quite true. Um, and, and the reason, um, roughly speaking, is just that the, 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 the twist, um, the dijkhoff witten uh, twist um, that you can add, so this is basically some three co-cycle, so some, some element of H3 G U1. Well, it, it transforms in general non-trivially under the Galois group. Um, 
there are a few more things to say to make equation 21 precise, but roughly speaking, this is the story. So if Q is some Galois element, it sort of acts non-trivially in general on the, on the, on the Dicraft wave twist. Um, but the point is that there are some examples um, which at least look fairly complicated. So discrete gauge theory is based on things like semi-direct products of relatively um, complicated cyclic groups. Um, if you take uh, such theories and more complicated ones, um, it turns out that there are many examples where S and T um, transform, uh, do, do not transform under the Galois action, um, but, but, but this twist, this, this three co-cycle does, okay? So, so, so this is, um, this is, this is um, an obstruction, uh, at least one obstruction that exists to classifying um, such, such theories is that three co-cycles in general can have some uh, interesting non-trivial um, uh, transformation properties under the Galois group, um, but things like S and T uh, may not. Um, but actually, uh, so, so there, there are a much broader set of counterexamples, um, and, and they seem to be actually very, very common in the context of discrete gauge theories. Um, but again, um, one lesson that the Galois group seems to point to that seems to, one direction that it points you in that seems to be true is that all these obstructions are essentially related to F symbols or to three co-cycles or maybe generalizations of three co-cycles. So, so in this case, it's related to um, three co-cycles of, of, you know, of this, uh, basically of, 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 um, of the, of the, um, basically of the SPT that you use to, 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 to generate your gauge theory. Um, but more generally, um, it seems to be related to obstructions involving sort of more complicated non-group like um, F symbols in the theory. So this is something that, 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 that we're working on that, 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 that this uh, work in progress at the moment. I, I can tell you more if, if there are questions. Um, so I think it's 10.56, I'm gonna have four minutes. Um, I, I don't think I'm gonna have, so, so, so one thing I would have discussed, um, so, so I don't know, I have four minutes left, right? Yeah, so I, I, I don't know, I, I don't think I'll have much time to say, to say anything about Galois invariant theories. Um, let me just, let's see. So let's see, what do I want to say? Yeah, so, okay, maybe I'll just say something in a nutshell. Um, so um, with, without much effort, it turns out that, well, so if, if, if you want to, so, so if we want to look at basically Cyril's question, so Cyril mentioned that there was, saw this sort of exchange between these two factors um, in, in this twisted Z2 discrete gauge theory under the Galois action, you can of course ask how, 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 how general is this? How can, can we sort of categorize theories that, that have this kind of property? Um, and uh, the, the way to do that essentially um, is the following. So first of all, you have to go to unitary theories um, because basically if you think about non-unitary theories, you can easily convince yourself that the space of such things is just too wild. Basically you can just take a product over a whole Galois orbit and of course that will be Galois invariant. Um, but that will include in it, in general, many non-unitary theories. So the first thing you have to do is at least specialize the unitary theories. Um, and the, the, the way to try to find some classification is to first note that basically simple properties of unitarity, like positivity of the quantum dimensions, um, essentially tell you um, through some rudimentary Galois theory and some theorems that you've probably learned in, in middle school, like the rational root theorem, basically tell you that the um, quantum dimensions, these S3 expectation values for, 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 for loops in Galois invariant theories, um, these quantum dimensions have to be integers, okay? So this is a big simplification, and this follows from unitarity. It's not true in non-unitary theories. And then essentially um, in the literature, um, there, there are some, there's a conjecture that all theories with integer quantum dimensions are what are called weakly group theoretical, and due to some nice work of Natale, the weakly group theoretical theories have been classified. So, so essentially using unitarity, elementary school math, we get to integer quantum dimensions. And then um, using um, this conjecture that integral quantum dimensions um, correspond to uh, theories with integral quantum dimensions correspond to weakly group theoretical categories. You can use a classification of weakly group theoretical categories combined with a theorem that uh, I proved with Rajaf on, um, on the Galois, the preservation of Galois invariance under um, gauging uh, one form symmetry um, to, 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 to essentially classify these theories. So, so what Natala said basically is that 
um, all weakly group theoretical theories can be constructed by gauging zero form symmetries of some list of abelian TQFTs. And she wrote down that complete list. Um, and so um, uh, this procedure that she uses, um, th this gauging procedure is essentially the inverse. It's gauging a zero form symmetry. So it's the inverse of, 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 of gauging a one form symmetry. So essentially using this theorem at the bottom of the slide, um, we can gauge one form symmetry and go back to the list. So we can start with the Galois invariant theory, which would be weakly group theoretical, and we can gauge one form symmetry to invert Natala's procedure and basically go back to the list of abelian theories that she wrote down. And then we just have to pick the Galois invariant ones, which is a very small list. So, so the result seems to be that all, uh, all generalizations of, this, uh, of the type of theory, of this type of Z2 twisted discrete gauge theory um, that, that, that are invariant under the Galois action, um, are essentially gotten by uh, gauging zero form symmetries involving products of arbitrary numbers of abelian discrete gauge theories, along with the spin eight at level one theory um, and, if, and, and an infinite set possibly um, of, of, of ZP times, of, of theories with ZP times ZT fusion rules. And, and you can literally make this list very precise. It's a sub list of, of, of the theories that Natalia considered. So, so, so this points to the fact that, at least for unitary theories, I think the, the program of trying to organize the space of, of theories um, according to, um, according to um, Galois orbits um, it, it is a potentially promising one. So here I have some number theory stuff. I'm going to skip over this because I think I'm running over. Um, this is basically some schematic discussion of why you should believe that the defining number field for these theories is a CM field. Um, so I'll just conclude. Um, and just say that, um, yeah, Galois conjugation lets us explore uh, TQFTs in a lot of interesting and well-organized ways. Uh, and um, so a question, uh, a natural question is um, if we can use this, this Galois action to sort of explore the space further, um, find, find, find a set of observables, uh, nice observables that don't depend on, on fusion spaces, on, on choices of basis that characterize TQFTs. Um, and of course, another question is how does this work in higher dimensional theories? Um, in higher dimensional, in higher dimensions, it seems that there are, the classification results are much stronger, that they're subject to certain assumptions. People more or less know what's out there. Um, so, so, so there, maybe there's a little less work to be done, but, but it could still be an interesting and probably well-defined uh, question. So, okay, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but so so somehow I mean this is I'm just referring to the work of Theo Johnson Freud or Freud I don't I even know how to pronounce it. Topological. Yeah, topological. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm talking about topological. Of course, another interesting question is to to generate the generate non-topological things. Yeah, that's another area where, where I'm also thinking. But yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, well, yeah, so, so, so one thing I neglected to mention and should have is actually you should use the first thing to do. So, so what, the, the dumbest thing to do is to first look at the one form symmetries. Like, do, do they have the same one form symmetries? This just follows from the same fusion rule. So this is nothing deep. Like the next thing you should do is use our theorem, uh, which basically says that the zero form symmetries are, 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 are the same or are isomorphic. So that kills certain things. So for example, you could take, um, you could take something like um, toric code or basically with what's called just Z2 um, discrete gauge theory. Um, and then you could take something like spin eight at level one transcendence theory. And if you just look at fusion rules, um, then you, know, you could say maybe these are in the same Galois orbit. Well, in fact, we know by these results that, that they're each in their own individual Galois orbits, but sort of more immediately, more physically, you could look at the zero form symmetries. I mean, they simply do not coincide. Toric code has a, a symmetry, which, which has an electric magnetic duality, sort of an analog of this S3 thing that Sakura was asking about, but a simpler version of it. Um, whereas spin eight at level one 
um, has you know some other kind of symmetry. It's a symmetry of three fermionic lines. So it's a, a symmetry that you have an, an, a, a permutation symmetry of those lines. So, so the symmetries are just different. So then you immediately know. So one thing I would say is look at the, look at the zero form symmetries as well. If zero form and one form don't tell you enough, then look at uh, two groups. <laughs> look, look at the Poznikov class, for example. Is, is, you know, does that change? You, you basically, under Galois action, you can't start from a theory with a non-trivial two group and end up with a trivial two group in the, in the cohomological sense. So, so these, of course, wouldn't, may not, may not fully, may not be enough to fully resolve your question, but at least these are, there are some additional sort of strong symmetry checks that you can do, um, I think, as a result. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, well, so, so, well, I mean, um, well, so, so, well, so, so the rigorous answer is that you, 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 if you're powerful enough, you would look at these F and R symbols and you would ask, are they in this, are, do they represent the same element of, of, of cohomology? Yeah, so, so, so F and R, they form, they, they are elements of some kind of cohomology, right? So, so in the case of abelian theories, it's just some abelian cohomology. In the case of more complicated theories, there's something called um, the davidov yetter cohomology, which is some generalization of this. And these, you, you would check that your theories will end up being different. They'll, they'll, be, they'll correspond to different cohomology classes. I mean, that, that would be the rigorous answer. Like, so, 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 yeah. And there would be observables that would change as a result. I mean, I, what, one interesting question is, one thing you could ask me is like, okay, if you didn't know about, I mean, constructing, of course, constructing abelian cohomology is very easy. Constructing things like this davidov yetter cohomology is very hard. Like there are some people like Schweiger who, who have some simplifications and are able to sort of get a handle on it, but it's very hard to compute anything. Um, but um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think there are, there are, there are looking at symmetries is something um, is, is, is something which is promising, but more generally, you would like to have some invariance, like the S matrix, or you'd like to replace the S matrix with something else more exotic that it would be easy to compute that you could immediately sort of tell things apart. Right. So, okay.